So, and uh, you know, one of the just one of the other things that, that came up is um, a couple of you brought up that uh, that this material. Uh, well, you phrase it differently than, than I'm going to phrase it, but basically, um, it was a little bit of a leap or or a big leap from this material to actually what you do in the classrooms and and applying it directly to the classrooms um, was not quite as easy as as I would have liked it to be. So um, the the two of you who actually who wrote that I've, I've I've asked if I could speak to you, but I'd love to hear from other people. Um, maybe just reach out to me on the on the community or email me. Um, or if you have ideas now, uh, you know, how could I have made this more um, more applicable to uh, or do you have ideas on how I could have made this more applicable to uh, to what goes on in the classroom? Any any thoughts from anybody? And if you if if you don't right now, that's fine. Uh, I'll be you know I'll, I'll I'll reach out or you can reach out to me. Mitch, I was one of the people who spoke yeah. up about it, saying yeah. it wasn't. Um, no, and so and, and I want to say thank you so much because when you said it, when you both, it was like yes, you know something. They're right. This is a little bit of a stretch. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, and it wasn't that like you said, it wasn't that it's not impossible to do. It's not. It just wasn't something that I was like, okay, I have this technique. I know how to use it step by step. Mm -hmm. We practiced using it in the class. I can go and I can feel comfortable implementing it in my class tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It just, it, they require a little more thought, which is kind of part of the whole process, right? Of changing your mind isn't something that happens instantly. Changing our practices isn't something that happens instantly, especially when we're doing it intentionally. Mm -hmm like a lot of the coursework that you're presenting is meant to be used, is meant to be used very intentionally. Mm -hmm. So um, that's where I just had my reflection to you that it, although it wasn't something that I can just take immediately and use right away, like some of the other different like math classes or reading classes and implement immediately, mm -hmm. it's still very valuable. And even through this process mm -hmm. of creating lessons it um, really opened my eyes like, hey, just think about it for, for you know, a half hour. Mm -hmm. You can come up with something to to present to the class. So very good. And like I said, even though it wasn't something that had immediate usage, I think that's kind of the point. Well, so. well thank you. Yeah. So I'm still going to reach out to you because if you don't mind, and uh, and maybe we can brainstorm a little bit and maybe we can come up with some things that that I could do next time I teach the course to make it easier i guess to apply to the classrooms if you don't mind yeah no that'd be fine okay. thank you no thank you okay yeah and then from those suggestions i was thinking all also a little bit more about the kinevin framework so i've just put together a couple more slides on the kinevin framework before we go into the lesson plans um i'm going to share um share my screen and Let's see. So you should have um, the Kinevin frame. You know, it's uh, Mind Shifting 2, Session 6 up on the screen. Ho hopefully you have the right one. And then, um, so to me, one of the advantages of going through what the Kinevin framework is in advance is that um, uh, actually um yeah so is one of the advantages of making sure that that people understand the kinevin framework before you get into a problem solving session is that when it when you then take whatever the situation is whatever the problem is and you discuss and you it turns out that there's a simple problem or a complicated problem or complex or urgent chaotic you get certain immediate benefits and and um, so for example, for a simple plan, you all know when you're solving a simple plan, you're looking for a quick, efficient way of, of solving it. And everybody can then focus their attention on other priorities. When everybody understands that there's a complicated situation, um, then your discussions don't become, Hey, it's my way or the highway discussions become, well, look, if we do this, there's these trade-offs. And then we do that. Those there's, there's those trade-offs but it makes less important it's less important which specific thing is going to happen and 
you're not going to have this discussion about, well, that's not going to work. Well, that's not going to work because everybody can pretty much agree. Most, most of the good plans are going to work somehow or other, which means that people aren't going to fixate on any one solution. And there's less discord in the group, which then means that it's more likely to get consensus because everybody's going to know that more than one solution is going to work. And so it's a little bit arbitrary which solution you 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 have, but everybody can work towards towards one. And it makes it easier to use experts, um, especially when those experts have already demonstrated that they have helpful knowledge and skill, because very often in complicated situations, you need you need data, you need a way of dealing with the data, you need analysis. Um, and then you need to know how to execute it against the plan. So experts become more valuable. When everybody understands that something is a complex issue, then they know in advance that there's not going to be one solution. That's Nobody's, nobody's going to know what to do. So people are prepared that whatever you do is probably not going to work. And they're prepared to iterate. And instead of looking at trying something and it not working as failure, they're looking at, okay, I'm going to try this. I'm going to take a look at the results and I'm going to use the results as feedback. And then um, people kind of understand that no one is an expert. So you're not looking for somebody to say, this is what we should do. You're looking for things to try, um, which also means that you know, people are willing to try different things and they're less likely to blame when things don't go right immediately because nobody could have, you know, foreseen what was going to happen. And then for urgent and chaotic, you know, you know that has, something has to be done. So first of all, when you know that a plan, something's going to be, you know, something could occur that could be urgent and you let people know about it, people are much more willing to prepare. And that's why we have fire drills and that's why we have shooter drills or you know all, all these different drills because we're preparing for something so that we hope that it doesn't occur to us but if it does occur people know how to do something safely um, so in addition to prepare to being more willing to prepare for emergencies when it's an urgent chaotic situation people are going to be let me let Aaron in uh, people are more, more willing to follow instructions uh, if they know if they understand the nature of, a, of an urgent issue and people aren't going to waste time on thinking about the long-term issues. So it's going back to the, you know, a fire in a house, people aren't going to be thinking, Oh, wait a minute, before we leave, we should plan so that this never happens again. Uh, people under should, you know, people understand these four different domains. They're going to understand, okay, this is an urgent problem. First we focus on safety. Then we focus on the issues. So in general, you know, this is how understanding Kinevin helps with, problem solving in different types of situations and then at the same time it all it when people understand this you avoid the types of mistakes where people mislabel problems so when people you know the our tendency is to think that every problem has one solution okay and so if something is complicated or complex you know everybody's arguing for their solution but if they understand the nature of complicated and complex problems they're not going to do that if people think that there's one right answer, they're going to be angry when their solution is not chosen and they're, they're not going to buy into whatever solution is, is chosen. Um, in which case, when the problems aren't immediately resolved, people are going to start um, you know, immediately going to blame. See, I told you this wasn't going to work. We never should have done this. I had my suggestion. You ignored me. Whereas, if, if they went into it knowing about complicated and complex issues, you 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 avoid that. Um, and when you think something is simple, you generally try to measure it or reward or punishment or punish based on different behaviors. And th those that measurement, rewards and punishments, always distort behaviors. And so you get changes to the system that that um, and changes to what people do to basically game the system. And then you know, if people think that this is something that we need experts in, or people think that we need analysis, um, you know, if it were a simple problem, this analysis is just going to be taking too long. But if we can, if, if people kind of understand, okay, this is a simple problem, we don't need analysis. Or if people think something is complicated that needs analysis and it needs expertise, but it's really complex, they're going to reject innovative solutions because they're going to say no 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 we can't do anything until it's proven you know i'm not going to do something with the i'm not going to experiment with some type of curriculum on kids well teaching kids is a complex issue you always need to experiment 
Um, if it's uh, if, if something is complex and people think that it's complicated, you tend to get mired in looking for information and trying to find the solution that's guaranteed to work, and there won't be one. So, in understanding complex, you know, complex systems, you're not going to get into that problem. Um, the same issue with blame when you, when if you think something is complicated but it turns out it was complex and the minute things start work start not working people are going to be blaming and then you also have the issue of, of rewards and punishments and measurement distorting behaviors and then again you know people who come in and say look we just got to we got to try things and see what works if it turns out that it really was a complicated or a simple system um, you know, and people are going to be trying things without thinking through what's likely to happen. Whereas in complex systems and in complex systems, especially if you're using the, you know, the OODA loops, then you're, you know, you're sorry, Aaron, is that okay? No. Oh, sorry. That was, okay. um, background noise. Okay. All right. Sorry. Okay. So in complex, you know, if, if people think something is complex, but it's really complicated or simple, um, you know, they're like, they're, they're very liable to, uh, try things without thinking through what might happen. Um, they don't take, take the time to see what others have done because they're just, they're just trying to, okay, let's, let's try this. Let's try this. Let's try this quick, quick, quick. Um, and then, you know, if they really understand complex, uh, then they also Wait. know that in complex, my middle name. that in complex systems, um, many complex systems do have complicated parts. And so if they really understand you know, the nature of, of, of these four different domains, they'll understand that there is a role for experts and thinking through before you, before you try something. And then, you know, we see it in our society, what happens when people think that something is urgent or chaotic, which would be avoided if people really understood that there's four different domains. You know, everybody operates from the short-term perspective when things are urgent. Um, they don't consider other options. And then they tend to follow a leader, and that leader may have a hidden agenda for personal gain. So by understanding these four domains, uh, this this part, you know, it's not necessarily directly related to the classroom, this part, but you're getting, um, let's see, I'm going, uh, let me go back. Okay, you're getting, oops, um, sorry. You're getting these advantages and you're avoiding these issues. And then I was was thinking, well, so how does it help really in the classroom? And basically, when the kids understand these four domains, it really helps with their problem solving skills because they're thinking, oh, is this a complex issue? Am I trying to, to try things out? Is this a complicated issue? Do I need to analyze something? Should I just should I just be able is this something where I should just know an answer and be able to answer it? Um, it gets them thinking beyond the surface. Um, in, and in complex situations, it really gives them the growth mindset, increased resilience, because no longer are they regarding things that they're doing as I'm going to try this. And if it doesn't work, I failed. In a complex system, I'm going to try this and I'm going to take the information and use it so I can try something else. And that reduces their anxiety about, about ambiguity. Um, with complicate, you know, if they understand complicated systems, uh, they start understanding when to seek outside help. Um, and it also prepares them for real world scenarios. And then I was thinking, well, you know, like, how does it help the teachers? Um, and using this, the Kinevin system and training students in these four different domains, it's really a method for guiding students in a way of solving problems, you know, identifying what the problem is, knowing when straightforward answers aren't going to be available, how to be more autonomous and take control of situations yourself and analyze them. It could be the basis for how kids work with each other on complex and complicated topics um, without uh, as many arguments as if they're thinking that there's one right answer. Um, with complex systems uh, and complex problems, it gets them more focused on feedback in order to improve rather than feedback is something that is, is a type of a judgment. It allows them to be more creative because they understand that there's no straightforward solution. They've got to try something and they understand better how to work under uncertainty and they're willing to consider new options. And then in classroom management, you know, if we're dealing with a complicated situation, 
if students understand that this is complicated and many different solutions are, are possibly going to be working, they're less likely to um, object to something or hide from it or rebel against it when the thing that they wanted to do isn't chosen. Um, and they're and and they're more willing to try different things um, when when it's a complex issue. And then this whole idea of taking things as um, simple, complicated, complex, and and chaotic, it's a great basis for discussing in something like social studies or or literature um, or stories or current events about. Um, you know, when we look at this, uh, you know, why um, would you regard this as simple, complicated, complex or chaotic and why and why are people framing it this way? And because they're framing it wrong, how is that um, changing the way they're uh, they're assessing the situation? So I, so I don't I, I'm hoping that um, that that helps and um, uh make the the Kinevin framework more more useful um to you all and any any comments on what i've just shared i have a quick question for you mitch yes um how would you suggest teaching the framework to young students i'm thinking preschool through third grade um so what I'm trying to figure out now is where is the thing that allows me to, oh, there it is, uh, stopping shares. Okay. It was hiding behind a window. Okay. So how young? I'm thinking preschool through third grade. Okay. So I, I'm thinking, you know, preschool, kindergarten, and probably first grade, it, you know, it, it might be a little bit much, um, you know, uh, but starting in second grade, we can, you know, we don't have to label it, you know, simple, complex, complicated, and chaotic, but we can start say with them, you know, uh, when are, when are there situations where everybody knows the answer and when are there situations when maybe they're new and nobody knows the answer and have them start getting into discussions about, uh, situations where there is an answer, situations where there isn't an answer, when is it really important to, um, to look for more information and, and get them thinking in those terms. Is, is that yeah. helpful? Yeah, definitely. I, I knew that there needed to be a change in vocabulary. Yeah. Um, I just wasn't sure like what, if you had any suggestions on what we could change those to or how best to kind of present the information. Yeah. I'm, let me see if, um, from the last time I taught the course, Oh, that's the um Mitch, I also think I'm sorry to, yeah. to interject, but I, I do think you could start in preschool just using some of the concepts. Um, not necessarily a whole framework, but certainly preschoolers could understand simple um mm -hmm. problems and then moving into complicated as they try to negotiate um different things like sharing toys and things in the classroom and the housekeeping and different things like that. Mm -hmm. It could certain there certainly it could begin at that level, um, and then when there's examples of other types of problems, it could be brought up, but not oh, necessarily yeah. a focus. Mm -hmm. There's yeah, uh, I'm there... thinking like small, medium, large problems. Mm -hmm. you know, yep. Yeah, sizes yep. of like cups compared to like McDonald's cups. This is a small problem. Mm -hmm. This is a medium problem. This is a big problem or large problem. And, so that was my first. Mm -hmm. And then there's a, uh, in the last class, um, somebody took it was Kim Johnson and she suggested using the book, what should Darla do oh, as yeah. a way to teach these con mm -hmm. a lot of these, some of these concepts. Okay. I, um, I've completely forgotten that book, so I don't even know what, what the book is about, but, um, I don't know. Are you familiar with it? I am. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you so and and I think the idea of using kids books where kids as um like Nancy said uh confronted with big problems little problems mm -hmm. and thinking about problems as as you know using different ways of solving them I think that you know that's a good way of doing it. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you for bringing it up. Okay. So um so now 
what we've really been waiting for is um is the lessons so um so who who wants to present their lesson and get it over with I could go, Mitch. Okay. Senior. Great. We'll get it we'll get it rolling. Okay. Do you uh can you share your screen or do you need I don't think I would be able to share my screen, but I could just give you a lowdown. Okay. Well I could I can I can get the lesson up. All right. Okay. And then um let's see. I think this is right. And and kind of like what you were just talking about with them, uh primary level you know, trying to implement it somehow, some way. Uh, I think maybe that's what I'm trying to do here or what I've been doing mm -hmm. in the classroom, not knowing that it's, I'm OODA looping until I took this course, but mm. it made me think about that. Okay. So I think I have the lesson up, right? Yep. Okay. Now, now, now the book there, you know, you guys could look at that anytime you want. You don't need to share that. It's on YouTube. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you don't, you don't necessarily need to share that. It's there for whenever you need the, where it says book, have you filled a bucket today? Um, but that's the book I, I've been using. Uh, I teach first grade. Uh, I've been using this book for a few years now. Uh, have uh -huh. you filled a bucket today? And uh, it's definitely, you know, primary. And uh, it's been an approach and a behavior plan I've used for a few years now in the classroom. The kids seem to relate to it. Uh, it has been successful and effective. Uh, you know, the bucket, like it says there, explaining the bucket, the bucket is our heart. Our heart holds all of our emotions. Uh, when others choose to say and do nice things to us, it fills our bucket, uh, fills it up, makes us feel happy. And when others decide to dip in our buckets, that makes our heart feel uh, empty, hmm. upset. So, you know, daily we are either filling buckets or dipping into them. Uh, I always tell my students and at the end of the day, have you filled a bucket today? Uh, and, um, you know, just, it, just to give you a vision of, uh, the classroom, uh, in the class, I have a big board that displays bucket filler on one side and bucket dipper on the other side. All the students have their own heart with their name on it <clears throat> during the school day. If a student decides, uh, and chooses to, uh, bucket dip, let's say for whatever reason, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, not being, you know, being unkind to other classmates, misbehavior, things like that. Uh, and I, and I, I'm a softie. I give the kids many, many opportunities and, uh, you know, to fix their choices, you know, but uh, after maybe, you know, three, four times, they don't want to, you know, they refuse. Then I guess I get a little, well, I become the firm teacher. But uh, yeah. at, at any rate, uh, if a student does decide to do these things, uh, they will then, uh, the bucket dipper will then move their heart over and they move it. Uh, they get up, they move it over to the uh, bucket dipping side. And then, of course, I find a moment during the uh, during the school day to, to uh, discuss the situation uh, with those particular kids. Mm -hmm. uh, as the day moves on and their behavior improves and I observe this, I allow them to uh, move their heart uh, and they do it once again. They mm -hmm. move their heart back to the bucket filling side and Traditionally, it makes them feel good about it and proud. Uh, but now the uh, this chart or diagram, I called it a chart, a thinking process. Here's where the OODA looping, I think, kind of comes in mm -hmm. a little bit, uh, is new. I haven't done it yet. It's, it's you know, because of this course, it's new uh, and it's uh, and I'm still cre creating it. I'm not a very good artist. I'm going to let my my wife probably do the artwork. <laughs> so mm. um, You can't be worse than me. <laughs> I think I could draw trees. That's about <laughs> it. Uh, but uh, at, like I said, I, this stop, think, decide, and reflect. Uh, like I said, this is new uh, during this course and throughout our wonderful and great discussions. It's it often made me think about this bucket filling and dipping approach that I've used, and what new thing you know could I add to it to make it better? And I felt that this chart or diagram would be a good addition and uh really i'm planning on using it and implementing this after christmas break i thought it would be a you know a nice way to start the new year and should create a should create great discussion i felt that to stop think decide and reflect uh would be a simple yet effective tool to share and use during a one-on-one -on -one or small group discussion uh mainly with the classroom bucket dippers or really anyone <clears throat> this type of thinking approach implements 
to me, uh, a simple type of OODA looping uh, methodology and process, which we've discussed during our mind shifting, this mind shifting class, you know, here. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, what you've been just talking about with the others a few minutes ago, how can you kind of use it in a primary kind of uh, thinking and level? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'm hoping that this, you know, a uh, uh, thinking process chart can hopefully help the child reflect on why uh, perhaps they're dipping or behaving this way, uh, help them come up with uh, some different choices or approaches they can use. Uh, and like we like we were saying, at a young age, it gets the student to think, I, I believe it gets the student to think and reflect on different situations and take ownership of their actions, choices, behavior and thinking uh, helps them use some kind of helps them use some kind of thinking process mm -hmm. uh, on how uh, perhaps to treat others or solve problems um, and reflect upon, um, you know, poor choices or or poor behavior it allows them to think about other possible approaches and strategies. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, I'll be part of some of those discussions uh, yeah. with them and, and it gets them thinking about solutions, outcomes, and of course, that we talked about during this course, consequences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and really just a, a last note, uh, I always tell the kids that, you know, uh, that you can be a bucket filler, uh, not just at school, but at home or anywhere. Um, because everyone has a bucket that needs to be filled. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, so, you know, like, first of all, uh, relating this to, um, to understanding your, and how old, by the way, how old are the kids? Elementary, uh, you said, it's, right? It's, yeah, it's first grade. Uh, okay. So six years old, seven. Okay. So, you know, getting, you know, it's so important for them to understand their, to understand their emotions that kind of, uh, you know, there's, there's so many benefits to being able to label how you're feeling um, and and thinking about it that way. And to relate it to OODA loops is really cool. And I love your new vocabulary. The stop, you know, stop, think, decide, and either reflect or stop, think, decide, and ask yourself. I don't know which is more appropriate for the kids. Um, but, you know, let's STDA, let's say, as the uh, four-letter acronym. Um, you know, like, did you, did you STDA today? And, um, and then after the results, like, okay, so let's take a look in tomorrow and see that we make an improvement. And then, and then you're looping through it. I, that's, uh, it's, it's just something I hadn't heard, of, heard or seen before. It's, and I thought that was really cool. And like you said, I got it from really a book, you know, uh, kind of sparked the, uh, years ago, sparked the idea to use this kind of in the classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been using it for a few years, but, but I have to say thank you for the class. This course here really made me think about it. How can I change it? What can I add to it? And like you just said, I think that's a you know easy vocabulary to use with the kids. They can relate to it and I could use it definitely during, you know, um, you know, pulling them during the school day off to the side one-on-one -on -one, or if mm -hmm. it's more than one student in a little small discussion and going over that process. Yeah. Uh, no, well, thank, thank you. you for that. No, thank thank you. Um, and I think this will be useful for other teachers. That's um, that you know that's why we 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 put them into the spreadsheet so that um, you know other people can get a chance to use them also. I don't know, any any comments. I love that you're taking this and already incorporating it into existing work that you're doing. So you're actually building off of something. I did something very similar in the lesson plan that I created actually. Um, and so I love that it, it's just reinforcing a lot of the work you're already doing, as opposed to you feeling like I have to create this whole new plan on a whole new way of teaching right. and operating really nice integration, Dean. Well, thank you. And I was thinking, oh, you know what, I'll do it next school year, but you know, why wait? I think I'm going to try it. You know, after we're off Christmas time, we're off for a few weeks, everyone forgets about things for a while. So it will be a nice way to come mm -hmm. back and start the new year. Good. As long as my wife does the artwork. Right. Or somebody. <laughs> or, right. or right, right. Or could, you know, it could be chat GPT. <laughs> you know, right? Draw me right. a whatever. Right. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Okay, good. Thanks, Dean. Who wants to go next? I'll go. Okay. Let me see. Hi. Um, so I can't tell. 
I had oh, the slideshow sort of the thing, and then I just had a handout because I right. find if kids write, they focus better. Okay. Do you want me to share my screen? Um, I'm going to wanna... try. It's green, okay. so I think it'll – I'll see. Okay. Oh, nope. It says host disabled participant screen. Oh, sharing. I'm so sorry. You know, That's okay. Let... You can no, share. No, no, no. I can um... – there you go. Now you should be able to. So I, I the, and the reason I do that is that I, I used to do a lot of uh, webinars and I had some group take over a webinar I was doing and put all kinds of pornographic pictures all huh. over the screen. And it's like, OK, I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> I don't know what people are seeing. Uh, are we're seeing, seeing this. It's not quite a, at the, the presentation yet. Um, I think you have to click above. Yeah, there, there we are. But it's a small window, so yeah, you might have to. Oh, hold, on. Um, I'm doing wrong. hold on. Oh, I know what I'm doing wrong. Okay. Uh, there, there. That better. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, uh, hi. Okay, so I am in the library. I'm the librarian at a high school. So we get the ninth and 10th grade classes coming in to pick books and do independent reading. They usually come in about once a month, all the different teachers in those two grades. Um, and what I have found is that students are not always very eager to read. And um, I thought maybe giving them, like they say they don't like it or they don't understand it and they are confused or sometimes they legitimately are, but sometimes it's because they get distracted really easy or they're not focusing or they're talking with a friend. So I thought maybe this would be a good way to start. We've also been using growth mindset at the high school. So um, I, you can't say, I don't like to read. It's like, I don't like to read yet, or I haven't found a book I like yet. So we're sort of reminding them about that. Um, and I think it's, is Chris, Chrissy here? Cause I borrowed this from her, um, the exact wording of it, um, because I thought it was really good. Uh, so basically, I'm going to tell them what UDA is, and then like observe, notice what's happening, orient, understand the context of the situation, but then I want them to put it into their own reading time, because they have to read for a certain amount of time, not just in the library, but also in their classroom. So when they select a book, think about like, are you really reading or are you making googly eyes at your friend? Are you really reading or are you just kind of like have it open and you're falling asleep? Like what's your own behavior like and the environment? Is it super noisy? Is it hard to concentrate? Um, try to orient to do something new. Like what can you do to fix the situation? Like maybe not sit with your friend. Um, try it and then act and start over. So if you don't like the book, try a new book. If it's something that you're not paying attention, try seeing how you could focus your attention better is sort of it. And that's pretty much as far as I got. But yeah, I just was hoping it would be helpful um, to keep them more focused and also to understand that it's an iterative process. And, and what I'm seeing is it's a method for you know, for them taking ownership of what they're doing because they're yeah. thinking about it. And it's a method of giving them voice. Because if you're saying to them, well, you're you're just making Google guys, or you're just doing, you know, whatever it is that they're doing, you're, you're always sitting next to a friend. Why don't you sit next to one, uh, somebody else? Um, it's discounted. You know, it's like, oh, she's making, she's really mean. Look what she's doing to me. Okay. Yeah. But um, getting them to think about the, you know, the consequences is, um, and iterating, I think that's really cool. It's a, it's a good yeah. example. Yeah. Any, any other comments from anybody? Well, Tracy, thank you for sharing. No problem. How do I unshare my screen? I'll try. And if you can't, I may be. I can. I can stop it if you want. Oh yeah. Hold on. Okay. I think yeah. I did it. Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. Good. Yeah. Thanks. Um, okay. Uh, next. I can go next if you don't okay. mind uh, Great. sharing my lesson okay. plan. Uh, let me let me get it up. 
and we go to share. Uh, so and what I did for my for my lesson idea, um, if I didn't say this before, I, I teach Spanish in a middle school and an activity that we often do, uh, me and the other uh, grade eight Spanish teacher uh, involves having the students read uh, short articles and texts in Spanish, uh, entirely in Spanish. We have like a magazine series that the kids are reading. Uh, and I find that uh, a lot of students really don't know what to do with something like that, because, of course, there's a lot of a lot of words they don't know, uh, or it might just not be an activity that they've done before. Uh, some students aren't super interested in reading in the first place. Uh, so I thought that um, the OODA loop idea is kind of similar to how I want them to be thinking about reading a text. Uh, so in the class, uh, before they start reading, we talk about different reading strategies that you can use when you're reading a Spanish text. Um, things like guessing the word's meaning based on you know cognates uh, or context. Uh, focusing on what you know and not overly thinking about what you don't know, things like this. Um, and the students kind of understand the concepts or the strategies um, as strategies, but I don't think that they're very strong at using them. And I think mm. the OODA loop idea is kind of what I want them to be thinking about while they're reading. So they might start reading a text in the first couple lines, you know, they know what it's saying, and then they hit something that they just, they don't know. And so then I want them to think about like, what strategy is going to help you um, you know, unlock the meaning here in this part of the text. Um, why do you think that strategy would work? Try it. What have you tried? You know, why didn't that work? Try something new mm -hmm. uh, and kind of go through the same sort of process. Uh, if you scroll down a little bit, I think I wrote some questions um, maybe in this section here. Uh, yeah, like ask, what strategy did I try? What strategy can I try now? Uh, what strategy am I going to try? Am I going to try? Um, and then um, continue reading. Um, uh, and or or try to reread if if you got because sometimes you keep reading and then you you realize you didn't understand it and you got to go back. Yeah, um, and I so see. Kind of I, keeping, I see those strategies here right above it also. So yeah, right. Yeah, so trying trying to keep them kind of meta aware of like, am I actually understanding or are my eyes just going past the down the page? Mm -hmm. You know, and um, sorry, there's some noise. Uh, you know, and what strategy uh, would work in the context? Uh, and that that was pretty much it. I think down below or down below, I put a like a screenshot of an article that we've we've read uh so you know a strategy might be like looking at the picture obviously uh or you know using a word that's similar to english yeah, this sort of thing so that, that's pretty much it uh for, uh, for my lesson no i um yeah to, uh, again it's it's something that you're using uda in order to give kids you know voice choice and a sense of taking responsibility for their own learning and giving them a tool that they could then use for other things that they're learning as well. And, you know, you're right now you're, they're applying it to Spanish, but then once they master this idea of, you know, Hey, what a strategy did I try? What's going on? Uh, what, what strategy, your strategies could I try now? Um, what, what am I going to do, do it and then reobserve? I, I, you know, that gives them a path to uh, constant improvement. So, yeah, uh, really interesting. I, you haven't had a chance to use it, I'm sure, right? Because you just came up with it, right? Uh, no, yeah, I just wrote it yesterday. Yeah, so I, you know, like, um, if you, I mean, if you don't mind, when you try it, if you could just let me know, like, what did you learn from using it? That would be, I mean, you know, the class is over, so you don't obviously don't have to do that. But I, I'm really curious because to me this seems really interesting. I, you know, I'd, sure. I'd love to see mm -hmm. it working. Sure. Okay. Um. Well, thank you. No, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Who? Who next? Oh, I've got the whole spreadsheet here. So these are the these are the um, lessons that I have. So we've had. Um, we've had four, right? right? Who wants to, who wants to go next? I'm happy to go if nobody right. else wants to. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I'm also happy to share my screen if you're sick okay. of sharing your screen yeah. or you're welcome okay. to do no, it no, either I'm, way. I I'm, just realized my camera's not on. Um, not that you can really see me very well today, but, um, Give me one second. It says sharing is not turned oh, up, yes, turned of on. You of can course. request. 
If so, um, yes. <laughs> uh, allow. Yes. There you go. Okay. All right. Let me pull up the file. Okay. Hopefully you can all see. Yep, it's right there. Uh, my document. Perfect. Um, so as I've shared with all of you guys before, I am not a classroom teacher. Uh, I do work with teenagers and uh, people of all ages, but uh, nearly all of the work that I do is actually outside of the classroom. So whether it's in groups or after school activities or what have you. So I've designed this exercise to be uh, for most age groups, but you know, from a from a traditional educator perspective, I would say this would be high schoolers and above. Um, but it, I've used this. Uh, this is a type of exercise I have used before, but I've incorporated some of the lessons into this. I've done them a little less overtly um, because I find, especially once I start working, particularly with certain adult groups beginning to introduce new terms and new frameworks. So I may not necessarily use the term OODA loop in the work that I'm doing with them, but it is in fact the way by which we are getting them to think about this. So um, this is a gifting exercise that I do. Um, but specifically, this theme was around connecting different dots, right? So we can find ourselves getting stuck, you know, in our context. We talked a lot about that, about how it's hard for us to see the context that we are in. You know, a fish doesn't realize that it's swimming in water, that sort of a thing. So to be able, if you have an idea and want to move something forward, you sometimes need to have other people who can contribute to that idea, but also challenge you to think a little bit differently and helping you to get unstuck. So using things like OODA loops and specifically the anti-fragile mindset, um, you can begin to activate some of these new ways of thinking, new resources, and help you approach your challenges and open you up to a whole new set of resources. So I start the exercise by explaining the concept of a gift. And really a gift is, you know, as I say here, something that you have that you willingly give to another person. And it comes from a place of authenticity, of good intentions, and you don't expect anything in return, right? You are focusing on what could I offer to that person, uh, whether it's an idea or a connection to somebody else, whatever it may be. It, it doesn't have to be big. It could just be a perspective on what they tell you. Uh, what this exercise is today is everyone in the group is going to think about what gifts might they offer to one person who is sharing an idea of something that they want to do. And we set this context to say that everyone in the room has a different lived experience, a different expertise, different backgrounds, access to resources. Everyone has value to contribute and that we frequently think we, oh, I don't, I'm not an expert in that. And so if I'm not an expert in how could I possibly know? In fact, we're delighted that you're not an expert in that because your expertise and your perspective will help us move the needle, will actually help us think about whatever it is that we're trying to accomplish in a different way than the experts would always think about it. And so we set that groundwork, you lay that context, and after you set the boundaries, you ask if someone in the group is willing to share something they want to do, no matter how big or small they've been thinking about, they haven't been able to get started, and they'd like their idea of moving their help, uh, this idea forward, want help with that. And just for the sake of example, I said they have an idea for in a community event, but they're afraid to share too many details for fear of getting shot down or that their neighbors might think poorly of them. It was just the first thing I thought of. This could be anything. It could be uh, I want to implement new recess at school like we worked on in class. It could be that, you know, I want to change my curriculum. I want to, whatever it is, whatever or it, it could is be a kid. Could, yeah, I mean, it really, could, exactly. Yeah. For, for a kid, it could be, I really want to try out for swim lessons, um, but I'm afraid I don't know. You know, I want to try out for the swim team, but I'm afraid I'm not good enough. Right. It can be absolutely anything. It does not have to be this, we sometimes think of things you want to do as big. We set the context. It can be anything under the sun. And so after that person gives that high level overview of what they want to do, you open this part up with a line of inquiry. And I've added some questions here. And I say, look, these exact questions might need to be adjusted depending on what they say, who they are. But this is as a guide, right? So you start with a line of inquiry. Why do you want to do this, right? What's the first thing you do when you have an idea? Who do you talk to about it? What details do you share? Do you share all of the details or you keep some of them back? What are the obstacles you're facing, right? What we're doing in this line of inquiry is teasing out 
this person's basically their right where they're already at in specifically in their observation and orientation stage, right? Where are they oriented? in the OODA loop, you know, they haven't made decisions yet, they're not acting yet, but where are they stuck in terms of not being able to move an idea forward? How big is this obstacle? Do you, you know, do you have ideas for dealing with it? Uh, what do you think you need to make your vision a reality? And then really getting into things like, you know, what could possibly go right and make your idea perfect? And what could possibly go wrong and make this the worst idea you've ever had, right? Mm -hmm. Beginning to get it tease out from that individual where they're at and what their current context is in what they're thinking about with this idea. And then the next step, after you go through a line of inquiry and begin to really get those answers, then you go in and open it up to the, the entire group and say, now we're gonna start in this gifting exercise. You know, what insights, perspectives, resources might you have to help that person just take their next step? We're not gonna focus on accomplishing the whole big idea, but what's the next step that they need to take? And, you know, just as we struggle to see our own contacts and we think of resources that finite and limited, Engaging all of you can help this person break through their tunnel vision, open their aperture, and actually might help them achieve their goal. And again, I give a line of inquiry that is a guide, not necessarily a script, right? And then so, you know, what could you gift to this person to take their next step? And I say, if people are struggling to understand, I'll say, oh, you know what? That's really cool. I think I have a cousin who does something really similar. And I know she had some struggles when she first started. I'm gonna gift you an introduction to her and at least you can learn from her mistakes so that you can maybe avoid some of those same ones, right? Like, I, or whatever it is. It doesn't have to be like, oh, I'm gonna gift you an introduction to a funder or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then get into, would you have a, approached this idea in the same way? This is to the whole group. Would you talk to the same people or focus on the same details? You know, what do you think are the greatest opportunities? What do you think are the greatest challenges? Could you see a different way of bringing this idea to life? And why would this idea matter to anyone other than the person who wants to make it happen? And we begin to get more of that in that orientation, more of the context and more of the understanding beyond what that person thinks they know. And beginning to bring in those other outside perspectives is where we then begin to see, oh, we might need to go back into this OODA loop a little bit more, or we might need to be thinking about the ideas differently. And the purpose of this is then to begin to focus on the goal of the idea, not the details of the idea, shifting that mindset a little bit more and connecting different dots to different resources. Um, so then again, going in, this is much more in the, you know, helping them orient in a different way beyond what they might be able to observe on their own, ultimately informing them of their next steps for decisions and actions in UDA terms. And then the third part of the exercise is to have a, an open and honest conversation about failure. And I say, oh, you, okay, now let's imagine you've done this and you failed. How wonderful for you, <laughs> right? Now, you know, something that you didn't know before, let's have that open conversation about what it means to learn from failure why we need to see things from a different perspective to ultimately succeed. So keeping all of these things that we've just talked about in mind, let's think about what might happen if we fell fat, you know, if you fell flat on your face mm -hmm. doing this and we learn more from failure and more and than we do from success. And this is where you sort of tease out the concept of anti-fragility just lightly mm -hmm. in a light touch way. And then you say, so with all of this in mind, what could possibly go wrong? Let's come up with our wild and craziest ideas. You know, there's not enough parking, there's traffic jams, there's unsafe conditions. You know, people with different abilities don't feel like they can participate or fully engage. Maybe you scheduled it on a day when there was another religious observance or something happened and you begin to go through imagining kind of like what you talked about at the beginning, Mitch. If we think about what might go wrong, could we incorporate these possible missteps into our learnings and make the idea and the goal stronger. So now armed with all of this information, what are you going to do next? Mm -hmm. And so the, what is you going to do next is the person who wanted to do something or the one yes. you're going to do? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. For the person. So the purpose of this exercise is, to, and then I go through it, I do it with multiple people. So you start with the first person and mm -hmm. say, you know, thanks for contributing. But the purpose of the group is to get them all to recognize one, that every single one of them has expertise and resources to contribute to any environment um, and to any, you know, they, just by the nature of them having a different lived experience than the person presenting, 
but also it, it it's also then helping people think about getting out of that tunnel vision that they have and connecting those different dots in their own head about, oh, I've, I've only been thinking, you know, I, I did this with a, a, a young group. They were still students of mine back when I was at, at a university and, um, and they were creating a business and they came to me one day and brought me flowers and they said, thank you so much because the conversation you, you brought us into, we thought we were creating a car sharing company. And what we realized was we were creating a data tech company and it fundamentally changed how we've shown up. And now they're actually one of the mm. like largest successful online insurance wow. marketplaces. So, you and know, you that won't 10%? I, yeah, right. <laughs> no, <laughs> I do not. Um, but again, the whole purpose of this process is to say, okay, you think you're here, mm -hmm. but actually you're, you're, if you open it up and let the other people come in and contribute to your idea, you may find, I had a, a, a meeting yesterday where a guy said it perfectly. He said, my job is to say, okay, this is the ladder you're on and you think you're here, but actually you're down here. And actually you need to realize that uh, you think you're on this ladder, but actually you're on that ladder way over yeah. there and you got to get back over here in a certain way. So the the purpose of this is to be a little bit more opening mm -hmm. and then also to get a little bit more comfortable with the concept of failure and actually understand that failure can be a design element into what you create. Yeah, I actually, I see how, uh, you know, maybe I'm being weird about this, but I see how this could be really applicable to kids in the sense yeah. that you know let's say the, you know you're you're reading a book and you have one of the kids play the role of somebody in the book who's who has the challenge whatever the challenge is mm -hmm. in the book yeah. and then everybody else is gifting things to help that person and you're walking that person through kind of an oodle loop like okay so now you've gone out and you know everybody's you know told you the things that they want to do now now what do you how would you analyze that? What would you choose of the things? If you choose that thing, what are the things that could happen that are good? What are things that are happening that are bad? How do you adjust to that and walk them through that OODA loop that way? Um, great idea. Yeah. Uh, and have, you know, kids learning that they can, that they can help each other. You could even help it, have it if a, if a kid is, you know, really wants to do something mm -hmm. and doesn't mind having the class help them do that going through, you know, the, the vocabulary has to change, but, yeah. um, but having a class help a kid achieve something that they really want to achieve. Yep. That would be I've, really cool. I've done this with groups of, uh, like teenage girls, for example, I do a, an international, uh, 15 to 19 year old mm -hmm. group of young women, um, coming from every corner of the world. And I, I have them engage in, and the, the things they want to work on, they're, they're big, right They're They want to, um, address issues of uh, violence against women in their community or what, you know, they, they, they are creating action plans mm -hmm. based on uh, what they want to bring back to their home communities to do. But mm -hmm. that's just the, the grounding orientation for all of them. But uh, this is a huge component of the work I do with them to say, okay, you're going to go back to Luxembourg and you're going to go back to Dubai and you're going to go back to uh, Kuala Lumpur. That's great. But you're actually now all resources for each other right. because the yeah. three of you are working on similar things. Yes, you have different cultural contexts and that's great. You need that different one. Each of you has gifts that you can contribute to each other to help you advance and move your ideas forward. So I have done this. Um, I haven't done it with particularly young kids, um, but I have done it with high school students and it's really resonated with them wow. in terms of empowering mm -hmm. and also recognizing that they can empower themselves to say, oh, wait, I can contribute. I have something to give. I, I don't just have to listen. I can actually be a, a contributor to it. Yeah. To me, it's always so interesting, you know, listening uh, to you, Emily, and, you know, Alden, Tracy, uh, Dean Tory, you know, like how you all take the material and and change it to make it better and more applicable to different audience audiences, you know, and the things that are important to you. So, um, so really interesting. And and again, you know, what one of the things that you did is you take something that you're doing and you say, well, how can I twist it in order to make it 
help people become anti-fragile or help people right. become more resilient um, using some of the material in the course. Um, yeah, really, really cool. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'll stop sharing. Nancy, I know you raised your hand. <laughs> yeah. Do you I have did. a question? Yeah. Go ahead. I did do. You? Yeah. I, Emily, I'm just wondering how long that whole activity takes. It would depend or on how big the group you... is and how many, like okay. how many times you want to go through it. You know, if, if you were short on time, you could just do like one or two people sharing. You wouldn't have to get every single, you know, I, I say <laughs> that it's best served for a group of 30 or less I think once you get bigger than that, it just gets unwieldy. Okay. Um, but I think if you're only going to have maybe, you know, a couple of people share or like three or four people share amongst the group, you could do it in 30 minutes. I mean, it's, okay. it's quick. Like it, you do this as a rapid fire thing, you know, give me the high level overview and then, you know, let's get into this. Tell me a little bit more how, what, you know, and I do it in a very conversational way because that's mm -hmm. just who I am. I'm a connector. So I'll say like, why do you care about this idea? Mm -hmm. Like what, what yeah. made you think about it? You know, so you're keeping it as a conversation going as opposed to just um, making it a, a formulaic way that's why i say that the line of inquiry is a guide and not a script mm -hmm. because you may yeah. something might trigger in what they say that gives you a different line of inquiry and yeah. you, you let that go um i've done it in 30 minutes ideally an hour is a really good time because it allows people to get into small groups and really work it and and do more i can flex it either way but if i were time compressed i could do it in 30 minutes okay thank you that's absolutely I, I, yeah great question I, yeah I, I like the framework. I may borrow it. Sure. Yeah. Let me know. Feel free to reach out. My, uh, okay. my email's on there. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. And, and I, and I can see how this be, this could be helpful in, in professional development is Nancy, mm -hmm. is Nancy, but just said, so. um, well, thank you. Okay. Um, who, who, who's dying to go next? Uh, Jesse and I can go next. Okay. Oh, uh, so who's going to share? Um, it might be easier if you can share since there's two of us sharing the slides. Okay, then I then let me let me pull it up and. And let me see if this view zoom. No, that one's there we mine. Go. This is not yours. This is that I pulled the wrong one. Yes, you pulled mine up. Oh, sorry about that. Um, Which I will go, but not yet. I think. Okay, no, I'm sorry. I just I pointed to the wrong. That's uh, that's on me. Okay, this is the one. Yes. Okay. Um, and that's just our pretty title slide. So you can go to the next slide if you want. I like this one. What do you mean? No, I'm just. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so Jesse and I both teach at a um, project-based school and we utilize the workshop model. So our lesson plan is orchestrated around that framework. Um, and so each within each of these slides, it'll kind of show like, here's where we are in our agenda. Um, so we uh, visualize this for our um, high school students, um, probably within our, our mixed grades, we have a, an advisory period called CREW. And so this would be a great chance for kids to kind of practice the skills of using the OODA loops and thinking through um, problem solving. Um, and so we are going to start um, with a card sort and then kind of explain. So our um, workshop yeah, model. And I'm going to I'm going to come to the end because these are the cards, right? Yeah, those are the cards. Okay. Um, so we made some examples there. Um, but yeah, so the first activity is going to be kind of an opener to help them kind of understand it, which is a card sort. Um, activity where they're going to place them into those different categories. Um, this is assuming that the kids know um, already what that framework is um, and then uh, go from there. So um, I guess, Jesse, I can do the card sort if you want to do the next part. <laughs> yeah, that works. Um, so the card sort was just those cards. They'd be given a list of different scenarios. Um, they'd read through them um, and collaborate with a partner then they would sort those cards based on the framework of simple, complicated, complex, or chaotic situations. Um, and then they would compare their answers with um, the next table. This is just kind of a warm up to get them thinking about, um, yeah, the different, the framework. 
Yeah. So then we would move into our mini lesson of like, what is an OODA loop? So like Haley mentioned, we would be going into this um, with the background that the kids already know the Kinevin framework. So we're just going to be talking about the OODA loops. Um, and so we created just a slide of what each of those letters represent. Um, a lot of what our workshop model looks like is just a very short mini lesson and more exploratory. So there's not a whole lot of information that they're given other than um, what the OODA loop is, just a kind of a general overview. And then they get to jump in um, and do a little bit of activity with that. So um, we just threw in the cycle as well. So just to show them that they, um, it is um, a cycle there and they can go through it many times and change what they need to. Um, you can move on, Mitch. Okay, so for our practice, we wanted them, this is still part of the mini lesson. So once they know what the OODA loop means, then we wanted them to um, get within partners or small groups and try to solve this scenario and come up with some ideas. So uh, the scenario we, we came up with was that you're working on building a bench for the school's campus. Um, and there's some criteria around that. It must be able to hold weight of three or more students, look visually appealing, and be weather resistant. Um, so they would work through that loop to try to figure out what the best um, option would be, how they would go about researching that um, and getting the materials. And so like step one, we broke down, think about this using the OODA loop. What are some possible decisions you can make about it? Um, then talk with your partner about the scenario, their thoughts, and what the solution could be there. And then um, we would we were thinking we could talk about it as a whole class, create an anchor chart um, that looks at how many possible ideas that everyone came up with and just show that importance of collaboration and how many ideas can be out there for one particular problem. Um, so then our next part is the would be the bulk of the class, which would just be problem solving. So taking that practice and then applying it um, a little more generally in their groups. Um, so that next slide, um, basically we're going to have them choose three complicated or complex scenarios from their card sorting situation uh, that they would like to try to solve with the OODA loop. So it's giving them more of that space to um, think through it and not just, you know, kind of spitball, but more of that um, uh, problem solving. And so then they would write down each step and get go um, a little deeper into those scenarios and then probably have a, a way to present it to the class at some point too. <clears throat> oh yeah, and the last part is share out. So um, so our debrief for the day that is, or no, we have a catch. Um, so as they're working, um, we would have students consider, um, okay, you're doing great, but let's assume that this first cycle failed. What would you do the next time to kind of get them really thinking through that critical thinking piece um, and kind of throw that wrench into their thinking? Because the OODA loop is, is many different cycles. And so, you know, what happens if it fails and getting them to think through that piece? And I'll let you do the rest, Jesse. <laughs> yeah, so as Haley mentioned, we would then go to our debrief, which is just share out. So. Um, pretty simple, just kind of last 10-ish minutes of class and talk about um, just a one-sentence summary of their OODA loop solution on one or two of their problems. Um, and then I'm sure many other students would also choose similar problems. So again, kind of just hearing everyone's ideas um, at, during those situations and how they overcame that first catch where they're, um, they failed. And so how did they come back from that? And I think um, the last slide is just the card sort. We, so we kind of broke it down like the top are simple situations, complicated, complex, and then chaotic. Um, mm -hmm. Just for our own brains to be able to yep. do that. But obviously these would be cut and shuffled. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop the share. So like, you know, go, going through this, it's like you've given kids a reason for wanting to learn it. Um, you've uh, explained the, you know, you, let, you explained or 
brought the kids through the concept. You had them try it with a lot of scaffolding, and then you have them continue to try it until they um, they probably have internalized the the steps uh, and throw in a wrench with that fail, um, you know, and then have them share it out so that that these should become skills that they can use without having to think about them a lot uh, when they're doing projects in the future. Mm -hmm. It's like um, really pull together both Kinevin and uh, OODA loops um, to, uh, you know, uh, l learning how to do projects. I, I, I'd love to find out after the kids go through this, if you find that they're doing better work on projects, I hope, you know, I would think that they would, but this, this looks really cool. Thank you. Yeah. We'll definitely let you know. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. Thank you. Please, please. Um, thoughts from, from anybody else? Yeah, really, really, you know, I, I'm always blown away by these lessons that, um, where, you know, people have been really taking, you know, these concepts and really making them a lot more concrete and more applicable to different to different audiences of people, different age groups or whatever. Th thank you. Thank you, uh, Haley and Jesse. Okay. Who, who wants to share next? I don't think there are too many left. So people yeah, left, good. right? Okay. Tori. Yeah. Okay. So you want do me to share my screen or do you want to do it? Doesn't no, I can, um, let me, let me give you rights. There you go. Okay. Let me. Okay. So I am using the OODA loops as well, very similarly to everybody else, to um, teach a lesson on helping children make healthy food choices. So, um, this could be taught in the classroom by the classroom teacher, PE teacher, school nurse, um, whoever would be the one to, to do it. Um, anyway, so lesson objective helps students between, distinguish between foods that are nutritionally dense using the go slow whoa technique. So um, an I can statement would be for the kids, I can classify foods into the go slow whoa categories to help me make better choices when I eat. So one of the things that is important to me is that there's not a labeling of good food, bad food for kids. And so I found this book online called All Food is Good Food. And um, I haven't had an opportunity to read it, but reading some of the reviews and whatnot, it seems like a fantastic book and incorporates a lot of different cultural foods um, as well. So you really start to reach out a whole um, different audience of kids through that as well. So that would be what I would start with. And then I would ask the kids to list their favorite foods. And you can ask each person or just take a list of your 12, 15, 20, put them all on a chart, um, and then introduce the, the idea of go slow and whoa foods. Go foods would be foods that are like fruits and vegetables, lean proteins, whole grains. Slow foods would be more of your processed fruits and vegetables. Um, your fattier proteins like ground beef, carb-based foods like pretzels or something like that. Um, and then, of course, foods with higher sugar content, foods like pudding or whatever. Um, I left out the whole like food category of dairy. Dairy would tend to fall into that um, slow food category, depending on what it is. Could be a go food for some Wait, kids. butter's not good for you? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> huh. No. So anyway... So, um, and then whoa foods are, you know, pretty obvious to us as, as adults, your fast foods. But ice should, cream is okay, right? I was put ice cream in the whoa food category, <laughs> you know. Darn. <laughs> so anyway, um, so after you've introduced the concept of go slow, whoa, go back, revisit the list of their favorite foods and classify them into a triple T chart or these go slower, whoa foods. Um and then, of course, come back and tie in the theme. All foods are good foods, but not all foods are good for us. And so how do we 
kind of work with that. Um, then you can always add to it. I'm sure, you know, there'd be plenty of kids who go, oh, but I like cucumbers. I like this. And that's fine. You can throw those on there kind of as you go. So then I would say work with students, the whole group to talk about how to build a nutritionally dense meal. Um, you know, use lunch as an example, include five items in the meal, making sure that three of the five items are go foods and only one of the items is a woe food. Um, and then after the meal has been assembled, again, tying the idea that all foods are good foods, but eating too many whoa and slow foods doesn't make our body feel as great. Um, and then as an assessment piece, you can use, um, I think I put it down here at the bottom. Yeah, I just pulled a stock image off the internet of a school lunch tray, basically, with the five categories that you can tell kids, okay, now draw in there. What are your three go foods? What's going to be your one woe food? Um, and then, of course, they can use slow foods as maybe one or two issues or one or two items in there. So as I was thinking through it, I had a lot of different ideas for extending this. Um, you can work with the school cafeteria to put real actual items in front of them. Um, send home a newsletter to parents explaining the technique. And then um, for a lot of families, you know, they just don't have access to a lot of these foods. So including information on how to apply for food assistance through food stamps, WIC, food pantries, things like that. Um, and then I thought it would be kind of fun to do with older kids, um, take them to lunch, have them make a plate filled with more of your slow and woe foods, and then put them through a series of activities, exercise activities, after they eat. How do you feel? Okay, now the next day or the next week, put more of your go or slow foods on there. Do the same activities. Now, how do you feel? So just really putting it into practice, throwing in an exercise element. Um, so under my mind shifting connection, this talks about the, the OODA loop and how it applies and how even for a lot of adults, it's really hard to make healthy food choices. And um, I talked about how even when you think you're making a healthy food choice with something like a chicken Caesar wrap from the store, you know, that probably includes minimal protein, heavy dressing, fatty cheese, processed tortillas. And that's not always like a positive thing. So what are some different things you can look for? Um, of course, making food choices like this is pretty focused on the orient stage of the OODA loop. Um, when you're standing in front of your pantry, when you're standing um, in the lunch line, or when you're at a restaurant, how do you orient yourself to figure out, well, what is available? What are my own nutritional needs? Um, what makes me feel good? What doesn't make me feel good? And how can I move move forward to make the best choices that I can? Um, some of the different references I put in different resources, an Amazon link to the All Food is Good Food, a couple different OODA loop links, and then the, glow, the Go Slow Woe technique was one that I picked up from PBS. And so there's a link to a video on basically how to teach that, more information on that. You could show it to kids. It is kid-friendly or use it yourself. And then um, just the plate that you can use as a as a resource, you can blow it up to be full size or just display it on a computer for everyone to see. So anyway, yeah, that was about it. Yeah. So, you know, as I'm thinking, there's so, so many different think ways I'm thinking about this. One is when you're, you know, when you're in front of food, you're making a quick decision. And so what you're doing in, in this, in these exercises, which is really ingenious, is you're preparing kids for something that's going to be you know, kind of an urgent situation or an immediate situation. So you're kind of letting them go through this slow OODA loop to think about the foods and then condition themselves so that when they're in the moment, they can draw on, um, you know, their their memory and they can use the fast OODA loop to say, no, 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 this is a, you know, this is a, 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 a a woe food. Um, I, I really shouldn't have more than one of these. Okay. These are go right. foods. So um, let me, let me, let me get three of these. And so you're, um, 
you know, you're you're utilizing the lessons of the of of Uda, um, and you don't necessarily need to need to call it Uda in order to in order to do that. You're just kind of incorporating it into nutrition, into getting kids to think about what they eat and to eat healthily, and to use the feedback from what they're eating to spur them on for the next you know for their next meal, so they can continue to get better at it. Yeah, absolutely. That was a thought that I kept coming back to was this is we're really breaking it down and making it a slow UDA when you're really intentionally teaching this lesson. But obviously the long-term goal is, I mean, we eat until the day we die, you know, how right. um, we want this to be a really quick, very easy thing to do. Because like I said, it's so hard for so many people, especially if you don't have a background of um, or experience with these nutritionally dense foods. Yeah. So. And Nancy, you have your hand raised. Yes, I do. I really like the fact that you're um, you've integrated the um, how does it make you feel into it because I think that's often overlooked. And if we're able to have kids pause and think about how the food made them feel, um, I think that's really an important piece in helping make healthy mm -hmm. choices. Um, so, as a health coach, I just think it's it's really important component. So, um, I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Yeah. It, um, you know, I look at it for myself. I'm currently pregnant and there's a lot of foods that typically made me feel fine that now don't. don't <laughs> yeah. so, um, it's, uh, it's something where it's like, nope, really taking that time to reflect a half hour, even immediately sometimes after you eat of how does this make you feel or how do you feel after some exercise in these foods? So yeah, the reflection piece was really important to me. Mm -hmm. And Emily, you had your, you have uh, raised your hand too. Did yeah, just a quick thing because uh, in the spirit of my own exercise and gifting, uh, Tori, I don't know if you know Stephen Ritz and Green Bronx Machine, but that's an incredible resource to help you on all of this. He's a science teacher in the Bronx who created the Green Bronx Machine and actually creates living classrooms and grows food and gets kids to, to really understand the concept of foods. What made me think of it, and I just wanted to say thank you for bringing up the concept of food insecurity, because he has, uh, Stephen is your buddy, right? I love, Steve. Stephen's my buddy too. He's uh, America's uh, favorite gangster, my, my favorite sustainable mm -hmm. gangster. Um, love him, highly recommend. Definitely, I've known Stephen a long time. I've done a lot of things with him, but um, but the he just posted something on- um, And, and I put his links, I put his link into the chat. Green Box Machine, I, and, and they have a ton of curriculum. They've got a whole YouTube series. There's videos that are cartoons, highly recommend. Um, but it's interesting because he he's at a conference or speaking or whatever, he's always on the road uh, in California and walked by a sign from Pizza Hut that says, we accept EBT, right? Oh, wow. okay. Right. And that's the immediate reaction that most people have, right? Is like, great, what about this? And I was actually grateful to see, I love the way you're talking about all food is good food. And actually the first woman to comment on it, I was I was glad to see that she commented on it. She, she explained it really well. She said, we can have all the judgment calls we want, but if you are food insecure and if you are homeless and you do not have any place to actually cook a meal or create healthy foods for yourself or your family, sometimes the only foods you can have to get a warm meal are places like Pizza Hut, especially if you're in a food desert. And so this idea of, okay, you know, we don't, we don't want to necessarily encourage people to be eating Pizza Hut every day, but sometimes just every now and then as a treat, wouldn't it be great for a parent to feel normal to just take their kids to Pizza Hut for a dinner? And if you're on EBT and you don't have a home and you don't have a place to be able to do this, food is about so much more than just nourishing our bodies. It nourishes our souls. There's cultural implications that go along with it. And so um, it was, it, it's been a really interesting discussion today on his LinkedIn about, you know, how do we feel about this? And the immediate reaction for most people is like, why are we, you know, allowing EBT to be used on Pizza Hut? And she went about it the entirely different way and said, yes, I fully understand Pizza Hut may not be the greatest food ever, but that might be the only hot meal that kid has all week. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's fantastic. And things like, um, you know, pizza can be tailored to be a, a healthier option, right. you know, veggie pizzas or even a place like Pizza Hut where I'm like, hey, they have a fantastic salad bar. Right. <laughs> you know? 
<laughs> so, um, but yeah, it was just like important to me. Like I said, there's a lot of kids who don't have the access. Um, so providing information for how to apply for EBT, WIC, food pantries, and then also, like you said, the cultural foods, you know, a lot of, um, whether they be Asian foods or whatever, where there's a lot of more carb-based foods, like that's okay to eat those. I understand that those are important foods for your family. Um, what kind of vegetables can we throw in with them or whatever? Right. So, no, thank you for sharing. That's a fantastic resource. Absolutely. And I, I just, I love that you're starting with that concept of all food is good food. It's about that moderation component to it. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. That, that's a great and, and prompted a great discussion. So, uh, yeah. So Tori, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Uh, who hasn't gone, who would like to go? I haven't gone Mitch and I okay. can go next. Okay. So do you want to share? Do, should I? Well, you were just in there, but right. I, I have, I can get it up. I can, <laughs> Um, okay. So let, let I can see you in there. <laughs> right. Um, right. I'm still, I'm pr probably still in there because I, I didn't close I the share. window. Okay. You, I have it open too. Okay. And you should be allowed yep. to share now. Okay. So the, um, document that I, it's just a word, I'm sorry, it's a, um, Google doc really, um, breaking down how I would use, OODA loops to support staff well-being after a ma major national event. And in this national event that I'm talking about is our most recent election. And um, I decided to use it around this because I decided that I would go to the owner of my company and ask, them, ask him if we could talk about, um, or if I could talk about or offer opportunities for people to talk about how they're feeling during this time. Um, of indecision and in, in, indecisiveness and, and decision and how are they feeling about the decision and all that kind of good stuff. And so you'll notice a little bit of a, um, a, a precursor is in like after a major event, uh, the way leaders respond really matters. And I wanted to make sure that people understood that because um, it, we tend to, as leaders, we tend to um, not say anything. And I think that that's not necessarily the best way to handle it. And I think that it can either foster a culture of empathy or deepen feelings of dis disconnection. Um, if we don't say anything, I think it deepens disconnection. So I feel it's important to say something. And so I really set this up as far as how could we work towards that culture of empathy through using the OODA loop. So beginning by observing, what do you notice that the climate, the, the emotional climate already is? And you do that by checking in with your employees through one-on-ones or casual team conversations, um, monitoring productivity and engagement, because people could tend to um, unplug, disconnect altogether, and then observing their work environment, noticing changes in team dynamics, heightened tensions, misunderstandings, and some of those polarizing conversations. And as you notice how these, observing how these things might be coming up, um, orientate around what might be happening, acknowledging the diverse perspectives that are within our company, um, creating a supportive framework for people to talk about shared values, um, prioritizing relationships and understanding first, um, identifying needs for resources that might be that we may not already have, like mental health resources, um, flexible schedules, stress management, uh, project time adjustments, different things like that. And then once we've done both of those, look, deciding what additional things we might want to put in place. And so this is where I offered um, some of these things to the owner of the company to do, start by offering moderated discussions to foster inclusive and respectful environments, um, establishing some communication guidelines and some norms to help, uh, to help teams navigate potentially sensitive conversations and then prioritize leaning into our company values, which is to foster unity um, to, we are one of our values is unity is uh, relationships and understanding first. So those are really why I, um, I wanted to make sure that we were prioritizing those as important instead of not saying anything, which ultimately would lead us away from those values. And then the act part, um, actually launching those moderated discussions 
Um, and then continuing to check in one-on-one -on -one, um, as, as we have one-on-one -on -one meetings, encouraging staff to take mental health days as they need to, encouraging open communication, having open door policies as much as possible. I'm reiterating respect and inclusion of all staff around our company values and then evaluate and adjust. So going back to the top and observing how are these actions that you've put in place actually um, worked or not worked? What do you know? So it would also ultimately go back to the top and we'd uh, really observe those environments again, monitor productivity, observe the, the work environment. So the intent was that it's a repetitive cycle. And so um, I not only turned this in for the class, I also edited it just a tad bit, taking um, the acronym UDA loop out so it was more e easily identifiable and shared it with the owner of my company. And I meet with him on Monday to start having some of those facilitated discussions and begin implementation of this, so. Yeah, because, you know, company culture and people's feelings and people in general are complex, right? And mm -hmm. so this is really not just for these times, but for, you know, this is a, um, a way for, you know, a any leader who's working with, with people to, to continuously monitor and take the temperature of how the people are that they're working with. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's and a, it, it was, it's a little easier for me being a staff person and not in leadership because I'm connected more with, with frontline staff working on projects. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that um, some of that observation piece will be a little easier, not not finite, because I don't I don't reach everyone. But and then I'm hoping that also the um, facilitated discussions will also help. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think this is a this is a really interesting blueprint that any leader can use. And really, you know, if you think about it, you know, you, we think of ourselves. Okay, so we're teachers, we're not leaders, but at, we're teachers, we're oh. we're we're leading the class. Okay, so it's a mm -hmm. way for teachers also to have kind of a way of gauge, you know, following this periodically to to kind of understand what's what's going on in the class. Um, a school leader, a district leader, a uh, a, mm -hmm. a team leader, any any leader uh, following, you know, um, how people are feeling, what uh, what are things one could do to improve the. Uh, the environment or the the atmosphere, um, trying out a couple of them, looking at the results and seeing how that worked. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, yeah, this would actually be very applicable to the classroom and, and schools. And I did it for my company because I um, am an education consultant. I don't mm -hmm. work in a classroom, um, but this was something that was um, really weighing heavily on me. So um, it just, this assignment just kind of led me in that direction. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um yeah i I'll, I'll use this with with, with groups also okay. i i think this yes, is a, this free. is a yeah. yeah this is a really helpful guideline i think so i'm not sure that there's is there anybody who would still who's hasn't gone who would like to go i think we've actually been through i think pretty much everybody anybody not go um i you, didn't go oh aha would you like to? I don't care. I well, I'd love you to. You'll have to but... share for me though. Okay. Uh yeah, then let me No problem. Uh let me pull your session up and then let me go to share. <clears throat> okay. Did you did you see it? Yep, I can. Yep. Okay. All right. So um I teach family and consumer science. Uh, at a middle school. So I thought, uh, how, how can I implement OODA loop in, in my curriculum? It's cooking, it's sewing, uh, it's personal, like business management. So I thought, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to try this with laundry. Okay. So um, on the next slide, um, I just showed a, a just a mess. Oh my God, that's my house. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> um, <laughs> my classroom too. Um, but like we, a lot of people live in chaos. They do and they just make it work. Um, so I wanted to take this picture and walk through 
um, what Uda mean and, and how we can solve our chaos here. Like what options do we have to sort this quote unquote mess? So the next few slides are going through that. And um, so I, I would explain what Uda is. Um, and I, I grabbed this off the, the internet. Mm -hmm. um, and then how I underline each um, acronym um, on the slides, but um, just going through and having them, you know, answer these questions, um, coming up with dis different ways in which, uh, how do we sort laundry? Uh, when it's done, what do we do with it? Just going through that whole process of not, there's not one way to do something. Um, mm -hmm. Your way might be a good way for you, but it's not going to work for this person. So what else can we come up with? Um, but what I really wanted to focus on in this lesson is then getting them into groups. And with laundry, you get stains. So I wanted to work through and do a stain activity using mm. the OODA loop. Mm -hmm. So at the very end, there's pictures of clothes with stains mm -hmm. on it. So what I want to do is give each group a picture and go through the OODA loops, um, starting with, you know, what do you see for the observation? Um, okay, then what are, what are some what are some things like maybe that you you can treat the stain with? Well, what if that doesn't work? What else are we, what else can we do so that they would have to come up with more than one way to to get a stain out? Um, my daughter plays softball and she has, of course, white pants playing mm -hmm. on dirt and grass. Mm -hmm. Like I've had to go through many different ways in little concoctions to get these things clean. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's what I wanted to do. And then that's brainstorming. Mm -hmm. And then this, this would take more than this would probably take three, four days to do after mm -hmm. the pictures and they come up and work their way through the process and come up with more than one way that maybe it's, this stain is going to get out. And, and then what? Well, then, okay, so we're going to put shout on it. And then what? What else do we have to do? Okay. Or we're going to put Dawn dish soap on it. And then what? Okay. And after you do that, what are we going to do? But I thought that we could actually do it. Hmm. So did this work? Why did we, why didn't it work or why did it work? So that they're having to think almost constantly, you know, yep. and, it, and again, it, it's okay to fail because mm -hmm. this might not come out. Um, so what else can we try? So you would do yep. different strips of, I would just, I, I, I've done stains activities in class mm -hmm. where you just cut up different pieces of white fabric cotton yep and stain it and okay we well, are gonna try shout okay just spray it on there okay let's see if it comes out mm -hmm. it didn't why didn't you why didn't it what could we have done um and usually you have to like get your finger in there and like activate it um okay we're gonna dawn dish soap you know even have them researching different ways to get grass stain out to get paint out to get oil out so and i guess it's complicated in addition to all that with that if their method is to try something and put it into the washer then just going through the washer cycle would if it doesn't get cleaned it sets it right so that it can't be in that ooda loop it can't you know they i mean they could come up with it as a possibility but that but 
rethinking it, they have to understand the consequences so that what they really want to come up with is things that don't make the situation worse. Worse. And and yeah. putting it into the washing machine with something that doesn't work is even worse <laughs> than not doing anything yet. Right. Because you 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 may ruin what you're Oh, and that's another thing. If it's silk, you don't want to put it in the washing machine, period. So part of it is understanding the material, right? Yep. Yep. So I I think that even with this act, there's so many different um, offshoots that I can do with this activity. Um, Everybody wants to know how to get a stain out of something, Um, even middle schoolers. And hopefully by doing it, it's it sticks in that file cabinet up there in your brain uh-huh. that when, when it does come time, Oh, I remember doing this. I remember we did this and it didn't work. I, we've got yeah. to do this. Mm-hmm. So, you know, yes. a lot of people just go right to that, you know, oxy clean shout, you know, right. And it doesn't always work. So that was my idea. Yeah, I'm. Look, I don't. I don't think I'm going to be able to find her on the internet. I thought I might be able. My wife worked. You know, for, so first of all, I this is really cool because I would. You know, because um, it really is is a to a certain extent a trial and error and a learning process, learning how to take stains out, and you're really giving the kids um, a methodology for trying things out um, using OODA loops. So, I, so I, I thought that's really a nice way of of pulling everything together. And, what I, and then just my wife worked for Consumer Reports for her, uh, virtually her whole career. And there's a woman at Consumer Reports named Pat Slavin. So I was looking for her on the internet and I can't find her. But her nickname at Consumer Reports was Pat Slavin Stain Maven. And basically it was her job to figure out which cleaners and which chemicals were best to take stains out Um for any stain on any fabric. And so she had this huge database, uh, you know, that I was thinking, well, wouldn't that be cool if you could access it? But she's not on the internet, so I don't know how one finds her. And my wife hasn't worked there for eight, eight years. So but anyhow, if you can find Pat Slavin somehow or other, she, you know, um, she was the expert. <laughs> I'll try looking. I will. Okay. Yeah uh even pat you know pat slave and consumer reports maybe you could find her that way okay thanks so any any other any other comments i just think what she shared was very interesting and i would be interested in taking that class and doing that experiment yeah, right wouldn't yeah would, yeah there are lots of stains i don't get out because i do not follow that technique so hmm. i might want to start <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I, in all honesty, like if you, uh, Dawn dish soap gets out a lot of things, but you, you really have to get in there and take your fingernail and rub, like rub the stain. Um, okay. Kids come down to my classroom all the time. I, I got paint on me. How did you get paint on you? You know, and I, I will take, like, I have endless amount of shout and I just, little swoosh swoosh on there and I get my fingernail in there and um that does work a lot but again we're working with cottons when you start working with other kinds of fabric it gets real tricky so um yeah okay. silks okay. good luck um I can't tell you how but, many shirts I've ruined by getting stains on them <laughs> yep yep and then maybe you forget about it so it's yeah. sitting there and sitting there and sitting there so it's always good to pre-treat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I also noticed in chat Kevin saying ivory soap ground ground in with a finger with your fingernail. So um, I I use it, it's um felt naphtha from um you can buy it at Walmart that also works really well. Yep, you gotta like rub it in and. The trick is getting getting your finger in the fingernail into aren't, the fabric. Aren't fingernails activity. like magical? Like yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just you know, like cleaning pots and pans. It's like somehow or other the fingernail works better than just about any other mm-hmm. way of cleaning yeah. that I know. 
Like, yep. And I don't have yeah. long nails. Mine are quite short, yeah. but I get get in there and just activate a pre-treater almost as soon as you can. Um, Cause it will help. It will. So that, so that was great. Uh, so Kevin, anyway, uh, so what do you think having, having listened to this extraordinary group of people talking um, and demonstrating, maybe you can give us a couple, a couple thoughts. Or can you unmute? Is that possible? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. I'm going to walk out of this room. So the sound of the bat hitting the ball doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, overwhelm the conversation. Mm. Can go into the locker room. Here. Okay. First, it's been fun um, hearing all the different applications, as, as you said, Mitch, you know, handing someone a Swiss Army and then witnessing uh, the different survival skills <laughs> it, are two different things. Um, this obviously has lots of blades, and you've got people here who are very willing to use everything from the paring knife to the corkscrew, and uh, so it's been fun. To, it's just that the difference the difference between what i just heard with getting out stains and all the way to uh, emily um kind of articulating and so much good articulation of the versatility um and the application i'm really i kind of had to take an extra adderall um <laughs> just to take this ride you know so i guess i'm i'm grateful this has been fun but now i'm pretty convinced that you're working with a pretty powerful tool or set of tools. These, well, so just, just so that you understand, these are pretty incredible people. That's what you heard. Yeah, you're just saying that because it's true. Yeah, that's true. That's, <laughs> that's true. true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, that was just fun. Yeah, now I want to go a little deeper so that I have something to contribute uh, mm -hmm. other than just uh, awe. So, uh, so yeah, there, there it goes. Okay, well, thanks. I know you're um, you're at your son's baseball practice, right? So, uh, so you know, thanks, thanks for joining in. Um, so, uh, so any comments from all of you on um, well, on anything before we, you know, before we go? What a wonderful opportunity to learn from some really great people in education. I Wasn't really it? appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah thank I'll, 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 oh, sorry, Mitch. No, no, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say the same. Uh, sorry, I keep forgetting. I turn off my camera when mm -hmm. you're sharing. Um, it's such a privilege to learn from all of you. And actually, so much of what you're doing in the classroom, I see so many applicable lessons to the stuff that I do with people of all ages. So, um, Thank you for the inspiration and for those ideas. So, um, yeah, thank thank you, everybody. Thank you for participating. Um, the um, I'm going to keep you everybody in the uh, community for uh, at least another week or so, and then I'll send you out messages. And if you want to continue, you're welcome to continue. As I've said from the beginning, this community is an experiment to see if we can get, you know, see if this is helpful to people. Um, and if it's helpful, that's great. And if we find out by, you know, the end of the school year that it has been helpful, so be it. So we, we learned a lesson and, uh, you know, hope to see you in other classes or online, you know, uh, email me your successes or your questions. If, um, if, if you, I'd, I'd love to hear from you and, um, and, and thank you, I guess, uh, I'll stop the recording and.